Uh, can you uh, turn with me, please? Just open up to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to end there. We're going to land there eventually. Uh, but I just want to... We've been on a bit of a journey uh, as a, a gathering for a few weeks now, and it's going to continue for some weeks. And we've been, <laughs> we've been looking at the, 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 the topic, the issue, the person of the Holy Spirit. And we've been going back to what do these writers have to say about the person of the Holy Spirit. We've all, when we hear Holy Spirit, it's like so many <coughs> other areas of life. We have pictures of, of, of what that word means. We associate words with pictures, not so much words with words. If I say dog to you, you don't think of the letters D-O-G. You straight away have a picture of a dog. I say church, you think of things and so on. And when we say Holy Spirit, of course, we think of things and usually the concepts we have are experiences we've had or sometimes positive, sometimes extremely negative experiences where things have gone to extremes or been weird or whatever. And so what we've been doing is going on a journey where we're trying to get back to what, what does the, the Word of God, what do these people actually teach us and what have they said to us about the person of the Holy Spirit? Because for Jesus to say, it's to your advantage that I go away, because if I go away, he's going to come. I mean, that, that to me makes the Holy Spirit very, very important when it comes to this Christian life and, and the way that we live it. Jesus also, uh, at one point, made this statement about the Holy Spirit too. He said uh, there, there was some, some, God was doing some things, there was a miracle, and a bunch of religious leaders came and they said, you, you, you basically you're doing this by the, the devil. It's the power of the devil, demonic forces. And, and Jesus made this statement. He said, hey, back up a minute. He said, you can touch the Father if you want. You can say stuff about the Father and you'll be forgiven. You can touch me and you can be forgiven. But he said, you touch the Holy Spirit. You will never be forgiven. Isn't that an amazing thought? I don't want to get into the doctrine of what that actual sin is of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What I want us to see is that from Jesus' perspective, the Holy Spirit was so precious and so important. Amen? Can we agree on that? The Holy Spirit was so central to this journey of faith that we're on. And so what we've been trying to do is go back to, let's. so often in, 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 in our faith journey, we do allow our beliefs and, and our theology to be governed by experiences. And, and while experience is incredibly important, I do believe that, I also believe this, that a lot of my experiences in life have been wrong. I've had a lot of experiences in life that have led me down paths of thinking and believing things that weren't right. And so if that happens in life in general, I also know that it can happen with God. And so we're trying to go back to, to this collection of ancient documents, the Bible, the Word of God. We're trying to go back to this, and we've been looking at and chipping away over a number of weeks, what, what is this this collection actually teach us about the Holy Spirit? Because we want to, we, we all have a heart, I believe, to follow God. We all have a heart to, to, to not only follow God, but who wants the best that God has for you while you're down here? I want the best down here. I mean, any time, who's ever gone on a holiday and gone, I'm, I'm going away for two weeks, but I'll settle for third, fourth, or fifth best? I mean, I've planned this holiday, saved my money, and I'm going somewhere, and I don't care if it's rubbish. You invest your money, your time, your energy, you plan. When you go on a journey, you want it to be memorable and you want it to be good. Is that right? And anybody here that doesn't want it to be memorable and doesn't want it to be good, we will pray for you. We will do it now if you want. Come forward. We will pray for you. Because there's something inside of us that wants good. There's a, this part of our nature that leans towards, I would, who would rather have good than bad? Who would rather have uh, excellence than tardiness? There's just something in... Who would rather quality than no quality? There's something in us that tends to lean that way. And that's because we're made in the image of God. And because I think God leans that way too. See, God, God loves rubbish. But God picks up rubbish and turns rubbish into something good. God picks up that which isn't and he turns it and makes it into something that it is and that it can be. God looks down and doesn't see who you are now and goes, that's as good as it gets. He looks down and goes, that's the starting point. I'm going to take you on a journey when you link with me and I'm going to take you from good to better to best and I'm going to keep taking you on a journey because that's what God does for us because he loves us. Like when we raise our children, none of us have our children and we go, here's what you are. You know, once upon a time you used to poop your nappy. Sometimes you'd play with it. You'd walk into the crib and it's all over the place. You're dribbling everywhere, snot everywhere. You're screaming at me at one in the morning. You're screaming again at three. You're screaming again at five. And if I don't come up and just give you something, you're screaming at me again. 
or in those days I couldn't give them anything. My wife had to, obviously. Um, but I do remember one night getting up in, in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning and, and I think it was Caleb, our firstborn, he's screaming and I picked him up out of the cot because I was a good husband. I was a good husband. And I would go, you stay in bed, love, and I'll go, I wouldn't have to do that. She slept like a log and she didn't even hear the baby. So I had no choice. I would have to get up because I could hear, wah, wah. And I'd go and get the baby and I'd pick the baby up. And I remember this one night coming into Jackie and, 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 and handing the, the, uh, Caleb to Jackie and she's half awake, half asleep. And then I hop back into bed to try to, you know, just rest till I take the baby back. <laughs> and she's getting frustrated and more and more frustrated. Eventually she goes, why won't he latch on? So I got up and went around the other side of the bed and he's, she's got his toes up on her nipple and the head's down here. I said, well, that's why he won't latch on. <laughs> Turn the baby around. Let's get on with this, shall we? Like some of you are thinking with my message, let's get on with this, shall we? <laughs> but we all want the best that we can. I, I want my life. Here's, here's the deal. I want to be the best version of me I can be, and I'm not going to find it by going to a Tony Robbins seminar. And I'm not bagging Tony Robbins, and I'm not bagging the self-help industry. But I know enough about me to know this. Anyone ever seen a movie called School for Scoundrels? Anyone ever seen? I'm not recommending the film. You've got to be careful every time you say, oh, I'm not, recommend I'm not recommending it. School for Scoundrels, there's a scene where all these guys that buy self-help books, the, the sort of guys that wake up in the morning and there's a pile of them on the, their bedsides, you know? And, so the, it's, and of course, it's not helping them. So they go to this seminar, and the guy running the seminar, he's a shonky, shoddy guy that's ripping them off. But, he does make a bit of sense in this one, one line. He, he says to the guys who are all sitting there, he says, I bet you you've all got a pile of self-help books on your bedside. And they went, yeah. And you go to this seminar and that seminar, you love this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, there's your problem. The problem is you're trying to get help from self and self sucks. <laughs> I thought, wow, that, that's almost a prophetic utterance, isn't it, these days? Like, I can't help myself. I just can't. I need Jesus. <laughs> That's, I, I came to him one way, and praise God, he's done some manufacturing and chipping and changing, and I'm a much better version now of who I was. But guess what? I'm not there yet. I'm still on the journey. I'm still chipping away, and I'm still going somewhere. I don't ever want to get to that point where I feel like I've made it, because I haven't. And I hate to burst your bubbles, people, but none of you have either. Hands up if you think you haven't made it. Haven't. haven't. Oh, there's a few of you. Okay. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so central and so important to our journey of faith. We don't get saved and then go, right, now I've got Jesus. Now my job is to perform really well for Jesus. You can't. Anyone experience that? We can't. Now, here's what I want to do this week in the little bit of time we got left. We've been talking about the promise of the presence so the first few weeks, we've really nailed the promise of the presence. Jesus said that, that if you repent of your sin and you turn in faith toward him, that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he went on to say this gift is for you and the next generation, next, next, next. Paul writes and says that you can't be born again if you don't have the Holy Spirit. So if you are sitting here going, yes, I've repented, turned my life over, then, then you have received the Holy Spirit. We, we, we've been talking about that for a few weeks, looking at what these documents say. I don't want to go over it and go back and watch it or listen to it on iTunes, whatever. But we've covered those bases. And last week we talked about tongues. And there are some people that think if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, go back and you can listen to last week. I don't believe that was the main purpose uh, of tongues in the book of Acts, which is where people get that theology from. It was much more missional than it was theological. Okay, And you can go back and listen to that. Don't want to get into it. But the point being, if you don't speak in tongues, speaking in tongues is not the only evidence of the Holy Spirit. There are other evidences, even, even, even biblically. There are other evidences. So we covered that last week. So we spent a few weeks talking about the promise of the presence. And I hope that everybody after last week walked away and you stopped second-guessing and doubting yourself because this is one of the things the devil wants you to do. He wants you to doubt the presence of the Holy Spirit with you because if you're constantly doubting the power source that Jesus promised, then you're going to live a certain way. You're not going to step into everything that God has for you. You're not going to be everything he wants you to be. You're not going to achieve and do everything that he puts you down here to do. Remember, it talks about that God prepared works for us in advance. Before we were here, he had some things that he said, here's a task, here's a job that needs to be done. I'm going to custom build someone to be able to achieve that and do that. The works came before we did. So we need to know and believe and be confident of the Spirit's presence in our lives. So, so my, my, my prayer, our prayer has been the last few weeks that we've just kept on ramming that down your throat. 
just randomly. You, you have the Holy Spirit, unless you have not repented and given your life to Jesus, in which case, no, you don't. But if you have truly done that, then you have the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay? And you need to believe that by faith. You need to lay a hold of that because you need to start to see yourself as a person filled with the Spirit. Then that's step one to beginning to live as a person filled with the Spirit. We're constantly second-guessing. So we've talked about the promise of the presence. Now this week, this week I want to go one step further and I want to talk about the problem with the performance. The problem with our performance. Here's what's probably happened to a lot of people. You come in on Sunday and the last few weeks you've been getting, looking at the Bible going, oh, yeah, I didn't see that. Yep, no, that's true. Yep, that's true. Yeah, I'm thinking this way. My experience is this, but I can see now from the Word of God that my experience is probably not completely right. I do have the Holy Spirit. I am. And, and, and hopefully you've been getting a little bit more excited about that. And, and, I'm, and hopefully last Sunday you walked out that door and I did, did say to you that I want you to walk out of here this morning with zero doubt that you have the Spirit in your life. And if you still got doubts in that, come and, come and see us, come and talk to someone, get prayer from someone. Nobody did, so I'm assuming you all walked out of here and went, yeah, we've got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, hands up, you did that. Yeah, you probably didn't do that. Yeah, got the Holy Spirit. But you know what I mean? You walked out of here confident of the Spirit's presence in your life. But then you know what happened? Then you started to live for seven days. You started living for seven days and a few things happened. In the course of those seven days, you lost your temper at somebody again. Don't put your hand up. I know who you are. You lost your temper. All of a sudden, you lost your temper, and you're thinking, oh, hang on a second. If I've got the Spirit, how come I'm losing my temper? Surely that doesn't add up. And then you gave in to that temptation again. Well, hang on a second. If I've got the Spirit, how come I gave in to that temptation again? And I went down that path again. And I did that destructive behavior again. And then you struggled to practice spiritual disciplines. All of a sudden, you've gone another week and gone, well, I didn't pray. I haven't picked up the word of God. I haven't talked to God. I haven't acknowledged the presence of the Spirit in my life. I didn't do any of that again. So maybe I'll hit a reset button today and I'll, I'll, I'll do it this coming week. But something will happen this week and you'll probably maybe end up on that treadmill again. You didn't act on that prompting you believe could have been the Spirit. You're all pumped, yeah, I've got the Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit goes, great, finally, you're acknowledging me. Now this is what I want you to go and do. Here's, I want you to give, I want you to love, I want you to encourage, I want you to share, I want you to... And, and we didn't. We didn't do it. You backed away from an opportunity to share your faith again. I had that opportunity there and I, I, I know that, 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 that I could have, could have spoken about you, Jesus. I know I could have offered to pray for that person. I know I could have done... I know I, but I backed away from that again. And by the end of the week, you're asking yourself, well, hang on a second. If I really have the presence of the promise in my life, if I really am a man or a woman or a, a young person in this room here and I have the Holy Spirit, then how come I'm still struggling with these things? How come uh, I still fall short? How come I'm still making mistakes? How come I'm not always nailing it? And by the end of the week, you can find yourself straight back where you started, where you're now questioning and doubting again. Anyone relate to anything I'm saying out there? It's gone awfully quiet in this big industrial shed. Here's the reality. Having the Holy Spirit in your life is not a silver bullet to all of your problems. Let me say it again. Having the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is not a silver bullet to every problem in your life. It's not. I know some people think it is. If I could just get filled with the Spirit, then I'd never have another problem. If I get filled with the Spirit, I'll never fall in temptation again. If I just get filled with the Spirit, I'll love reading my Bible and I'll make time every day to pray. Matter of fact, I'll have to schedule in talking to somebody else because I'll just be so passionate for God. All I want to do is talk with Him all the time. If I could just get filled with the Spirit, I wouldn't get angry or frustrated again. I'd just be like, ooh, just Mr. and Mrs. Calm. Because that's what a person of the Spirit's like, right? That, oh. If I could just get filled with the Spirit. So why is it that my performance, why is it that my experience is not lining up with what I think a person filled with the Spirit looks like? Probably because you have a wrong picture of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You've got a picture of what that person looks like and you put that expectation on yourself and then when you fall short, you go, well, I mustn't have the Spirit. And again, it's a vicious, terrible cycle that we fall into. Let me, let me just share a, a couple of stories or a couple of encounters in the Word of God just to show you what I mean. The Holy Spirit is not a silver bullet to all of your problems. Uh, let's look at the Apostle Paul. After being shown, who remembers the story of Paul? He is Saul. 
and he's killing Christians and persecuting people and doing all kinds of wrong things. And then he has this encounter with God where Jesus appears to him and blinds him. And, and, and we all know the story. He becomes this amazing man of God that writes two-thirds of the New Testament, goes on, plants churches, becomes a, 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 still to this day one of the most prominent figures in the history of this movement that you and I are a part of called the church. Paul, he starts off by knocking on the door of the disciples in Jerusalem, going, hey, boys, here I am, let me in. And what do they do? They go, no way, Jose. You kill people. You've been murdering us. No way. So they're not going to let him in. Along comes this dude by the name of Barnabas. There we go. If I had a Mars Bar Pauline, you'd be the first one to have it. Along comes a guy called Barnabas. Barnabas, of course, translated means son of encouragement, right? So here's what Barnabas does. Barnabas <laughs> gets up some guts and goes to Paul and has a chat with him and realizes I think this guy's genuine. Then Barnabas becomes the bridge. He extends incredible grace to him and goes, come with me. And Barnabas knocks on the door and goes, oh, it's me, Barnabas. And they open up the door. They go, oh, oh, who's that with me? Ah, oh, it's okay. He barges in. Here, I've got... And so he introduces this guy. Fast forward later on, Paul and Barnabas are doing this amazing missionary stuff. They're going out, uh, preaching the gospel, planting churches all around the place. Things are going good. And, and one of those trips, they grab a hold of a young fellow by the name of John Mark. And so they get this young guy, John Mark, and say, why don't you come along with us on this journey? So they go, so John Mark joins them on their missionary journey. <laughs> There's a point there where John Mark decides to leave the missionary team, leave the trip and go back home. We don't know why. There's no mention in the Word of God as to why that happened. All we know is that John Mark left them. So when Paul and Barnabas finished their missionary trip, came back to Jerusalem, reported everything that happened, everyone was happy. Then, then Paul uh, says to Barnabas, hey, why don't we go back to all those churches and let's go and encourage the believers and so on. And Barnabas says, yeah, great idea. Let's take John Mark with us. Watch what happens. Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to 39. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him. Why? Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. They disagreed so vehemently that they parted company. And Barnabas picks up John Mark and, and, and um, uh, Paul grabs, I think, Silas. But they had such a sharp disagreement. Paul, who believes Paul was filled with the Spirit? Who believes Barnabas was filled with the Spirit? Yep, here's two guys filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom, moving in the power of God, seeing God do amazing things, and they just couldn't get on with each other. They had such a sharp disagreement. This disagreement tore their friendship apart for a time. But look at this. Here's Saul, Paul, the guy that writes two-thirds of the New Testament, preaching about grace, talking about grace, giving us our doctrine and gospel of grace, and says to John Mark, you made one mistake, you're out. Where's the grace? Where's the grace? Was Paul not filled with the Spirit? Of course he was filled with the Spirit. But here we have a picture of a man filled with the Holy Spirit who, guess what? He's not perfect. Anyone relate in this room? Filled with the Spirit, but not perfect. Filled with the Spirit, but would, would throw away one of his closest friendships for the sake of, 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 of whatever happened with John Mark. He, he burnt one of his closest relationships because of something that some young guy did. By the way, some young kid who was on a journey with them, who's learning. Anyone ever have an apprentice at work? Anyone ever? Yep. And they make one mistake, bang, bang a nail in wrong, and did you fire him? Of course you did, because that's what Paul would have done. Just fire, you're gone. Made a mistake, you're out of here. You know how that feels? Is that when you shaved the hole in the back of that lady's head on your hairdressing? Oh, that's right. You hammered a hole in our wall once. Yeah, yeah you were fired straight away. I never let it. I don't let her put screws in the walls anymore because the reason that, that the screws, anyone doesn't know, the reason a screw has those little lines in it is because you put a screwdriver in. The reason a nail doesn't is because you use a hammer. Don't use a hammer on a screw, people. You can't use a screwdriver on a nail. Same thing. Anyway, lesson, lesson learned. Um, and you brought it up later on too, by the way, not me. So, Whew, I'm safe. So the point is this. The point is this. Here's Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, showing a lack of, lack of grace and being fairly brutal in what was his closest friendship at the time to a guy that if it wasn't for Barnabas, he wouldn't be doing what he was doing anyway. Now, does that sound like someone filled with the Spirit? Well, if we understand what being filled with the Spirit is, then yeah, that's quite possible. And in fact, it actually happened. 
Let's look at Peter. Peter, everyone knows Peter on this, on this you know, Peter's the one that said, I'll never deny you, and then did deny him and so on. But then Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches the greatest message and thousands are saved. He just looks at the Jewish people in the eye and says, you, you crucified him. You did this to him. And they scream out, what must we do to be saved? We all know the story. Peter goes on, does miracles, works, wonders, a whole bunch of things. Watch what happens. He also had an encounter with Paul, but this time maybe Paul was right. Paul writes about it in Galatians chapter 2. Verse 11 to 13, it says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his, Paul calls it hypocrisy. The other boy, uh, Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. I wonder if he's still got a bee in his bonnet over Barnabas. He keeps poking at Barnabas a little bit in this letter. But um, Anyway, the point he's saying is this, is Peter's sitting there, basically, he's sitting there with the Gentiles having a ham and cheese sandwich. And then the Jews come, and well, the, you don't touch ham. In the, and so he goes, oh, I better not be, 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 be seen sitting here with you guys. I can't eat ham. So he pulls himself completely away from these Gentiles and dives in with the Jews. And Paul, um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul comes along, and Paul calls him on his hypocrisy. He says, oh, you, you're acting this way here. Then when these guys come, you, you go over there, and now it's all about laws and rules. What, what message are you communicating? And Paul actually says, you, you, you're being a hypocrite, a pretender. You're being a hypocrite. So here's Peter, squeaky clean Peter, that's filled with the Spirit, doing healing signs, wonders, and miracles. And yet inside of him, he's afraid of this group of people. And so he pulls away from them because he fears more of these people than these people and plays the hypocrite in front of a bunch of Gentiles. Not a great witness. So, you know, if you're a person filled with the Spirit who doesn't do anything wrong, then he, either he's not got the Spirit or he is filled with the Spirit. And our concept of being filled with the Spirit is wrong. Want a better example? Let's have a look at the entire Corinthian church. <laughs> the book of Corinthians. Look at what was going on in this actual church community. Now, keep in mind, this is a church community where we get most of our doctrine about spiritual gifts. Is that right? 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, spiritual gifts and love, these great passages. There's so many spiritual gifts flowing. Spiritual gifts were flowing in the Corinthian church like points were for New South Wales on Wednesday. They just couldn't stop them. It's just happening. They're just going. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't stop it. They're just going. So you would think on the basis of the power of God, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the prophecy, all this stuff, these guys must have it together as a bunch of people filled with the Spirit. But read the whole letter. These guys have got some issues and got some problems. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. Paul says this. He says, It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. He's saying even non-Christians don't put up with this stuff. And you guys are sweet with it. You think it's okay. Now, here's the problem. He says, a man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put this guy out of your fellowship who's been doing this? He goes on in verse 6 and says, your boasting is not good. Your boasting is not good. So when we read that passage, we focus on the guy that's committing immorality. If you go back and read it in its context, Paul's not focusing so much on him. Paul's focusing on the collective church's attitude towards the sin. He's saying, you're proud of this. Because they were going, hey, we're free in Christ. We're not under law. So that means because we're free in Christ, we can do whatever we want. Hey, look how free we are. We got this going on. We got that going. Look how free we are. And Paul's pulling his hair out going, you don't get it. That's, that's nothing to be proud of. It's nothing to boast about. So when you read that passage, don't focus so much on the individual. Paul's talking to them as a collective community going, you're missing the point. At the same time, while you're proud and boasting of guys that are doing deliberate sin in your presence, at the same time, the Spirit of God is still moving through them. It doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense to us that, that then after rebuking them as a community, saying your attitude is wrong towards sin, and by the way, you know all those gifts that are flowing through you that the Holy Spirit's freely giving you? <laughs> it's like, What? But it's happening. So either, either the Holy Spirit wasn't moving through them, but we know that he was because Paul spent so much time addressing the, the, the works of the Spirit. Uh, or maybe these guys weren't filled with the Spirit because we read back here their attitude towards sin was pretty liberal. Or our concept of what it means and what we'll look like when we're filled with the Spirit is wrong. He's starting to see a picture here. People who are filled with the Spirit, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's presence was a silver bullet to every problem and every issue in their life. Now, just a quick show of hands. Who has an issue or a problem in their life in this room right now? It's 12 of us. 
Okay, let me just tell you, pride is an issue or a problem. Just letting you know, just putting it out there, people. Everyone in this room has issues, problems, and things. None of us are perfect, and none of us will be perfect. We're going to go through this entire journey with imperfections, problems, and issues. That's just the way it is. Uh, one day we'll stand before him, and we'll be shed of, of, of our bodies and our egos and our reputations and all the, the things that we worry about and fear about down here that we're trying to work through, but we're never going to end up a finished product. Thank God that God takes unfinished products into heaven. Amen? The, the, the finishing touches will be put on us when we get there. They're not going to be put on here, but it doesn't mean that we don't try. It doesn't mean that we don't go on the journey. So the point is this, that having the Spirit's presence in your life, it is not a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet to all of your problems. I could go on with other passages. You can read it in the New Testament. You'll find problems in people's lives being addressed all over the place. And these are people that at the same time you'll find records of them being filled with the Spirit or having the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit or being great witnesses for Jesus, all this stuff. But at the same time, the New Testament does not shy away from the imperfections of those who had the Spirit. So what's, what's really going on here? Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16 to 17, Paul, Paul kind of brings this concept together for us of, of, of being filled with the Spirit, but at the same time, knowing that there's a lot of stuff going on that isn't great. And here's what Paul says in Galatians 5, 16 to 17. He says this, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary or against the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary or against the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you want. I want you to understand this, that inside of you is a conflict zone. Inside your, your, your person lives a war zone. There's a conflict going on between the Spirit of God on the inside of you that is trying to lead you a certain way. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't possess you and make you do anything, but He's present and he says, I think this is the right way. Come walk with me this. But you also have the flesh inside of you that's also saying, well, I think this is the right way. Come walk with me. At the end of the day, you make the choice and I make the choice. But we have these opposing things on the inside of us pulling us this way. It's a little bit like the old cartoons. Anyone remember the Tom and Jerry? I used to love Tom and Jerry cartoons when I was a kid. Anyone remember Tom and Jerry? Yep, most of you older people would. Um, and especially those older than me, you would. Tom and Jerry cartoons, and, 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 and Tom, that was a cat and a mouse, and you know, the mouse would always um, uh, you know, play with the, the, the mental faculties of the cat. Quite disturbing, really, if you go back and watch it, some of the stuff you got away, you could never do that anymore. But anyway, I used to really mess with the cat's head. And there's this, this one particular one where I think it was Tweety Bird was involved. Remember Tweety Bird? Used to sit in the cage, little yellow bird. Tweety Bird's there, and the cat is looking at Tweety Bird. Grandma left the house and said to, 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 the, to the cat, you know, you're in charge of the house now, and, and, and you look after Tweety Bird. And, and uh, so he goes, yep, sweet, and Granny walks out. And then all of a sudden, he's standing there, and he's looking at Tweety Bird. And on his left shoulder, you see this little bing, and there's the little angel, little cat with angel wings, and he's there. Oh, aren't you such a wonderful kitty? You love that bird. Your grandmother trusts you. You do the right thing, won't you? You're wonderful. And he's going, yeah. And then all of a sudden on the other shoulder, bing, and there's this little red cat with a cape on and horns and a tail. And that cat's going, oh, look at that cat. Wouldn't you love to get a hold of it? Grandma loves Tweety more than you. You should take Tweety out while you can. Ah, and and he's, he's, he's basically saying, walk up to the cage and eat the bird. But the angel one is saying, don't eat the bird. Think about the bigger ramifications. Granny's going to come home. She's trusting you. She's given you a, a job to do, a task. Think about that. Think about the bigger picture. But the devil one's going, don't think about the bigger picture. Go and think about what she's going to taste like right now. Go and eat. And that's the battle that goes on on the inside of us. We literally have a conflict zone on the inside of us. Now, here's what I want you to see. If you didn't have the Spirit, you wouldn't have the conflict. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, all of a sudden, now that you've come to faith, don't think that getting filled with the Spirit is a silver bullet to your problems. Once upon a time, I sinned, and I did it really, really good, by the way, and I didn't care. Because it's what I did. I lived however I wanted to live, doing whatever I wanted to do because I wanted to do it. And that was enough. And even though I kept coming up empty, it didn't matter. I was still doing what I wanted. And then I come to faith in Jesus. And I realize that there is a better 
way. Well, one of the songs we sang there, uh, hallelujah, um, what's the one? You have so much better your way. And, and isn't it true? God's way is so much better. It's not easier. We don't sing so much easier your way. What a lie. <laughs> hallelujah. It ain't easier. We all know that. Jesus, as a matter of fact, prepped the entire church world by saying, if they treat me this way, <laughs> guess what? If they reject me, they're probably going to reject you. If they persecute me, they're probably going to persecute you. The way they treat the teacher, the followers are probably going to go the same way. And then we start going that way and we go, oh, where's God? He's left us. Oh, Jesus told us. He said, you're entering a conflict zone. And so when I was living for myself, I didn't really care. I didn't like the fruit of what I was doing, but I was still doing what I wanted. And then all of a sudden I come to faith and I realize there's a better way. I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I've got this thing on the inside of me. I go to do something and there's this thing on the inside of me going, bing. I don't think that's the best idea, Alan. God will still love you, but I don't think it's the best way, Alan. And then, I, then I'm going, oh, this must be the Christian thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm start- and then the other one, boom. Ah, just do it, Alan. You've been doing it for years. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Ah, God loves you anyway. Remember he told you that on the other shoulder. Go and dive into it. And in this conflict, rages. What am I going to listen to? Where am I going to go? When I didn't have the Spirit, I didn't have that conflict. All of a sudden, I've got the Holy Spirit. Now the conflict actually begins. Anyone else experience that? You are in a conflict zone. You should not be surprised when you find within yourself the battle. This is what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 7, I think. The thing I don't want to do, I do. And the thing I do want to do, I don't. Why? Because there's this battle raging inside. The Holy Spirit's presence was not a silver bullet to make me perfect, holy, and and, and, and all those things that we picture the perfect life to be. The Holy Spirit's presence was not a silver bullet to all those other things. What the Holy Spirit's presence was, was the kickstart for you to begin to overcome them. What the presence of the Spirit does is it gives us the fuel and the energy and the power to start to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, 27, I think it is, prophesying of when the Spirit comes. He says, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take out your your dead spirit and I'll I'll take out your your, 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 um, uh, heart of stone and I'll give you a new heart. He says, I'll take out your dead spirit, I'll give you a new spirit. And then I'll place my spirit inside of you. And he says, I will cause you to walk in my ways. In other words, I will empower you. I'll give you the stuff that you need. I'm not just, God doesn't just say, hey, here's the best way to live. Now do your best with your self-help books and your gurus. Go your hardest. God goes, here's the best way to live. Here's my tip. Don't try to get there by self because self sucks. So I'm going to put my spirit in you. And I'm going to lead you by my spirit. And what I want you to do, your part, is to learn to listen and get up the courage to obey. Start obeying. Start obeying what the Holy Spirit is saying to you because you're in a conflict zone. We live in a war zone. That's the world that we have. You know, years ago, uh, uh, Jackie's mother used to live with us. Um, Valley, my mother-in-law, used to live with us in, in Balna there. And I already see some guys smiling. No, I'm not going there. Um, I've got a great mother-in-law. I have a really, really good mother-in-law. Um, but uh, we, we're living under the same house together. So there was me and two ladies, me and two women under the roof. But you know what? I only had intimacy with one of them, deliberately. I mean, I love my mother-in-law, but the point is that I have both these women there, and both these women might want different things. But you know who gets precedence? The one that I've built intimacy with. The one that, I, the one that I've committed myself to in marriage. That's the one. It doesn't mean that my mother-in-law didn't have a voice. It doesn't mean that Val didn't have opinions or think things. But, but, but I've, I've, I've got somebody there that I have intimacy with. And the more I build intimacy with my wife, the right person, then the louder her voice becomes and the easier it is to get on board over here and the less it is over here. And, and, and it's very much like that with us. You are living under the abode of your life is, is two beings. There's the Holy Spirit and then there's the flesh. They're both still existing. The flesh didn't just disappear and go, poof, the minute the Spirit came. And they're both fighting. They're both urging and nudging towards control or influence. Let's put it that way. They want influence. They want to be the dominant influence in your life and in your decision-making processes. That's what's going on. Romans 6, verse 12 to 13. 
Paul writes this, he says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And he says, do not offer any part of yourself. Say, offer. Offer. We're offering. We're offering ourselves. We're not being made. We're offering ourselves. He says, don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Rather, offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So we've got these two things going on on the inside of us, this war that's raging within us. Our role is to choose which one will we submit ourselves to? Will we continue to submit ourselves to the flesh or will we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and the leading of God to become who he wants us to be and to do all that he wants us to do? So here's the thing. Our weakness is not the absence of the Spirit, but it's the absence of our ability to work with him in the battle. It's not the absence of the Holy Spirit. It's the absence of our ability to work with him in the midst of the battle that's going on. And we need to learn how to work with the Holy Spirit in the midst of the battle. So how do we begin to win this war of flesh versus spirit? How do we begin to take back ground that we know we've lost? And how do we learn to walk more with the spirit and less in the flesh? Well, Paul actually gives us a great answer in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Here's what he says. And it's very, very simple. It's not complicated and it's within the realm and reach of every single person in this room. You could start it the minute you get up. You could start it the minute I say it. It's nice and simple. Here's what he says, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds. It literally means to be of the same mind or to direct one's mind towards a certain thing. So what's he saying? He's saying those who live according to the flesh, they're directing their mind towards the flesh. They're setting their mind on what's best in that realm. Okay? Those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But... Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Whatever you set your mind to, let me dumb it down. Whatever you spend most of your time thinking about is what you're going to empower. If you spend most of your time thinking about this earthly, temporal, fleshly world, your reputation, your things, what people think of you down here as opposed to what God might think of you. If you set your whole mind on all this kind of a stuff. What your immediate gratification. I know, it's, I know it's wrong, but it's just immediately gratifying right now, so I set my mind on it and I do it. Whatever you set your mind on, that's what you'll empower in your life. And Paul's saying here, if you want to live in the Spirit, he said the key is this, you need to learn every moment of every day to set your mind on the things of the kingdom of God. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Set your mind not on this earthly, temporal place. So you lost your temper at someone, you gave in to temptation, you avoid spiritual disciplines, you don't respond to what you thought could have been the voice or leading of the Spirit. You step away from an opportunity to share your faith, we do it all again. What are we thinking of in that moment? Are we thinking of what's best for my reputation in this moment? Or am I thinking of what's best for God's? Am I thinking of what muscle I'm building in my life? Am I going to continue to build the flesh muscle by keep doing what that wants me to do? Or will I start building the spirit muscle by doing what I know the Holy Spirit wants me to do? Because I've set my mind on God and the things of God and the things of the kingdom in this moment. So this next decision I'm going to make is going to enforce one kingdom in my life or another. It's going to build one kingdom or another. It's going to be good for one area of my world, the flesh, or it's going to be good for the spiritual side. Which, which one? And in that moment, before I take that step, make that decision, my mind is set on Christ and the things of God, so I'm thinking that way. What spiritual kingdom will my next step reinforce in my life? What might be the motivating force behind why I want to do this next thing? Is it the Spirit motivating me towards this? Is it the Spirit that wants me to turn that computer on at 11 o'clock and sit down and look at that? Oh, I don't think that's the Spirit. I think, I don't think, that's, I think that's the flesh. What would the Spirit have me do? I think the Spirit would say, go this way. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to get instant gratification and then feel like rubbish afterwards and condemn and guilt. It's not building God into your world, is it? Not build- no, no. So the Spirit's, okay, what's the Spirit saying to me in this moment? What direction should I go? What fruit could this produce? Fruit for the kingdom or fruit for the enemy? Am I mindful in the moment of what is going on in the kingdom? Or am I just mindful of what's going on in the inside of me? Am I more mindful of the Spirit inside me or the flesh? You see, the degree to which we set our minds on the things of the Spirit is the degree to which we will experience what it's like to live according to the Spirit. So your body's a war zone. Don't be upset about that. 
Rejoice in it. It's evidence of the battle that's going on. It's evidence of the Spirit's presence. That's why, as Paul said, I want to do this, but I do that. I don't want to do that, but it's the battle that goes on when the Spirit comes, but the flesh is still alive. The Christian journey is about learning to listen to the Spirit and obey the Holy Spirit, keeping our mind on the things of God and less and less on the things of the world. And as we do that, we begin to flex the spiritual muscle and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we stop flexing the flesh muscle and guess what happens to it? It starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So as people of God, I'm going to encourage you again this week, go out there. And what I want you to do is to wake up every morning before your feet hit the ground. Tell yourself this, I am filled with power by the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, today I'm walking with you. I'll be with you. I want to listen to you. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel your nudgings, your promptings. I'm going to obey. And before I, I, I make decisions and, or, or do things, I'm going to ask myself that question. I'm just going to say, am I in this moment more mindful of the things of the Spirit, more mindful of the things of God and His plans and purposes for my life and the kingdom, or am I more mindful of just my own sense of immediate gratification or my own sense of what benefits me personally? What do I want to do? If we start living like that, you'll find that all of a sudden we begin to move into what Paul calls life in the Spirit. We begin to walk daily in the Spirit, not just popping in and out every now and then, but we begin to cultivate in our world the ability and the strength to actually become who we're meant to become. And as a result of that, to give ourselves the best shot at doing everything that we are called to do while we're down here for this tiny, tiny, tiniest of moments. I say it all the time, that crack in the wall there between those concrete slabs. The truth is, that is your life and my life. Eternity goes on for so long, and I've only got X amount of years here to do something for God, to become who he wants me to be and to make a difference for the kingdom of God, not just for me, but for my children, for your children, for the next generation and the next generation. It's not going to happen if I don't work alongside and with and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. God, thank you for, uh, Lord, each person in this room. Lord, we just pray, uh, God, again, that as people walk out of here this morning, Father, that there would be no second guessing, God, if if, if they have truly repented, if they have truly uh, repented of their sins and bowed their knee to Jesus, if they've truly accepted your sacrifice, your death on the cross as being done for them, God, if they've truly turned 180 and and are following after you in their hearts, then God, they should know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have the Holy Spirit in them. God, I I want to bind every lie of the devil in this place. God, all the reasons that the enemy speaks to us, why why we should second guess and why we think we don't have the Holy Spirit. Sin is not uh, 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 the absence of the Spirit. It's not evidence of the absence of the Spirit. God, and I just pray against that lie right now in the lives of people in this place in Jesus' name. And Father, as we leave this place in the next seven days, we are going to come into contact with people who don't know you. We're going to come into contact with people who've not experienced your reality, not experienced your presence. We're going to come in contact with people who think that living under the bondage of sin and fear is normal. And God, we know it's not. And so, Father, I pray for each person in this room. God, give us a chance in the next seven days to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to somebody out there who at this point doesn't understand it, doesn't know it, and has not embraced it. God, would you use us this week to reach people in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, in the universities, wherever it is that we go. Would you use us this week to make a difference for the kingdom of God? And everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you guys.